Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mikesh, and I'm going to be talking about scaling MIS with the cloud. So a little bit about myself. I'm a senior associate within the cyber risk practice at Kroll, working as a senior applied intelligence. I've had various positions in almost all industry verticals uh, in both a technical and non-technical form. And my day-to-day -day job mainly focuses on monitoring intrusion sets, as well as maintaining strategic and operational knowledge of threat actors, tactics, techniques, and procedures. I also develop and implement tools to aid with information gathering. So this keynote, what we're going to do is discuss how Kroll has <coughs> implemented MISP. We implemented MISP back in 2019 originally with the traditional MISP method. We then outgrew it very, very quickly and found a project by Tiago, which was HA MISP A, so high availability MISP in AWS. We'll then move on to our implementation and further high availability of this MISP instance called HAM MISP, and we'll conclude with some questions. So the traditional MISP. Traditional MISP was out of the box on a single big beefy server instance. It was mainly used for GUI-based IOC lookups for the SOC analysts, and we were querying Cortex for around 100 lookups a day automated. We were serving 50 customers at the time with on two different detection technologies. These were EDRs and ingesting around three to 5,000 IOCs daily with around 10 users. Now, as our as you can see, 10 to three to 5,000 IOCs a day is quite a lot for, for a lot of instances. And that's where we hit the first hurdle. And this was scalability. How do we scale this? How do we make this big beefy server, which has already got a lot of compute, scalable and future-proof, <laughs> as well as eliminate the single point of failure that it would cause? This is where HA MISP A came in, or high availability MISP in AWS. So this was a solution to overcome the initial problem of a single instant deployment as, and was presented back in 2019 by Tiago. A uh, huge, huge shout out to Tiago for actually sharing this with the community because it was something that we were looking for and it had solved the solution at the time. So since the initial deployment, we, were, we then scaled up with HA MISP A, uh, ingesting over 100 IOCs on a daily basis, serving up to 100 customers and four EDR and GAV detection technologies. Our, our active users for the MISP platform actually increased from 10 to 55 users, but even with this implementation, we did run into some limitations, this mainly being the database struggling with large data requests due to the number of correlations we had going simultaneously, as well as Cortex running in the background for analyzing those IOCs. So currently, since 2021, we've grown to supporting over 200 customers with six different detection technologies, as well as we're growing that as well. We're ingesting, so adding, removing, deleting 400 IOCs, 400,000 IOCs on a daily basis with almost over 50 million IOCs on, in our database currently. We have also 150 active users as well. So as you can see, we're dealing with a lot of IOCs, a lot of searches, and a lot of data. Now, in order to scale this on top of HA MISPAY, we came up with a solution called High Availability Mesh MISP, or as I like to call it, HAM MISP. Now, HAM, the HAM MISP architecture allows us for an instant switch over to take place, meaning that we have no downtime or next to nothing downtime, saving us time as well as reducing manual input from either myself or another team member. What we've done with the High Availability Mesh, mesh Network mesh implementation is separated each element, each core element of MISP into separate sections as well as being 
made sure that they were replicated across different uh, re availability zones and regions. So, for example, if the RDS, which is the Rational Database Service, in our instance, our primary one is the Aurora RDS, goes offline for some re reason, the primary EFS is automatically able to sync up and go to the secondary RDS without any interference. This solves the issue of actually having high availability in a production environment, as well as solves one of the problems which we were facing with read requests on the RDS, as this is very uh, expensive. So our current solution and workflow uh, on how we use MISP is we have two main MISP instances. We'll start off talking about on the left, which is our ingest MISP. Now our ingest MISP is a MISP instance that doesn't have a secondary availability zone. However, it's used for ingesting data. We ingest data through a in-house built tool which scrapes RSS feeds, web pages, as well as curated feeds that we've are subscribed to. This information then gets put into a normal MISP instance, which is supported by the main RDS and copied over to a secondary RDS. We then share that once the IOCs have been vetted and analyzed and are confirmed to be a true malicious indicator, that is then pushed over into our main MISP, which is on the right. As you can see on the main MISP, we have a lot of stuff going on in the infrastructure part. We have an AWS EC2 bastion host, which is what we use as a single entry point to control all of this, so it's not public facing. We have AWS lambdas, which I will go into detail on how that works in the next slide, as well as we've got the AWS EC2 main and main MISP instance. We also have an AWS headless MISP instance. Now the headless MISP instance, or needy headless as I like to call it, is an instance just to serve read, read operations. Now these read operations help with the load on the database, as a lot of read and write consecutives on a single database causes a lot of issues that we were facing, including 404 errors, 500 errors, and often causing the instance to crash. This is not a fault of MISP, it's just the amount of data we were pushing through and the way that we implemented the RDS. So, whoops. So we'll just go through our instance of main MISP. So as you can see, the user comes through and accesses MISP through either the main MISP, which is the GUI access, allowing uh, users to make changes, so add, remove, edit, tag on the instance that's connected to a RDS writer. We have the NHM, <coughs> ALB, excuse me, which is the needy headless MISP. This is just for API queries and read operations. As you can see, the RDS is connected to the read replica, which is also connected to an auto-scaling group. This auto-scaling group means if we have multiple multiple API queries, some which are requesting large data. If the in load increases on that RDS, another read replica is uh, spun up instantly and within a matter of seconds, traffic is diverted to the second R RDS read replica. Moving towards the bottom, we've got an S3 bucket as well as the superintendent. Now the superintendent is uh, what we like to call an in-house built tool, and it comes from Halo, because I like to play games, and we're a Halo fan uh, in my team. So the superintendent are a bunch of built-in in-house tools that helps with extracting IOCs from MISP and shipping them over to our detection technology. As mentioned, the superintendent is a suite of in-house tools. Uh, we use lambdas to send the IOCs to the detection, detection technologies with the use of ZMQ. So the way the process works is there's a change in MISP. That change, once it's published, gets sent to ZMQ. ZMQ then picks it up with a script. That ZMQ script then sends it off to AWS with an SQ, as an SQS queue. It then stores that IOC into an S3 bucket as well as into a MISP DynamoDB. 
Now we're using the we're using a DynoDB Dino because it's in memory, it's quick to access, and a lot fast. So once the IOCs are either in the S3 bucket or the DynamoDB, it gets sent to a detection technology lambda. Now this detection technology lambda allows us to create processes and lambdas and uh, manipulate the IOCs to search to suit each and every one of our detection technologies, as all detection technologies use different formatting. You can see we've got a DT secrets key as well, just above of DT lambdas. Those are used to store secrets, which are the API keys, in a secure way. Uh, we then push those out to the detection technologies. We've also implemented our Matamo spot to help us ease of searching. So if a user needs to search for a specific IOC, such as a Quackbot IOC, they can use a command line, uh, a command within Mattermost, and it will search MISP and bring back the information back to them. So in conclusion, everything that I've just said here can be hosted on a single instance, depending on the size of data, and the amount of correlations that take place and request. Both, of, both a single instance as well as uh, HAM MISP do have their pros and cons. The pros of HAMs are it's scalable infinitely as resources are just scaled and handled by AWS. The cons being you've got multiple MISP instances to maintain and patch, update, and make sure everything works in a flow. So this is a current solution that works for us. It meets our needs at the time. Uh, but yeah, uh, we will be publishing a detailed blog post on how to set up this infrastructure very soon. Does anyone have any questions? Sorry, I think that was pretty quick. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Yeah. We are, we are obviously anxiously waiting for the blog post. Yeah. <laughs> uh, really great setup. I really like it. But my question is, did you compare the price of having everything on-premises and in the cloud? Because AWS is pretty expensive. And also, uh, no, we know, we know that uh, MISP has protection to avoid a lot of correlation issues and so on. But how can you face, you probably also received a lot of events containing thousands of uh, IOC, so correlations start to use a lot of CPU cycles. So how do you handle this? And did you compare the price between on-premises and the cloud? So we did do a price comparison between hosting it in-house as well as AWS. Hosting it in-house was a lot more expensive to do, surprisingly. With AWS, we were able to subscribe to a set amount of years with them, which lowered the cost for us a lot more. Uh, in terms of uh, CPU usage, we have pretty much are able to scale the EC2s if more, uh, if more resources is required due to their being in an ASG, so an auto scaling group. So if an EC2 is in that auto scaling group, if more resources are needed on that EC2, another one spun up instantly through an AMI that we have pre configured. And so. Any other questions? How many people are using MISP in the cloud here? Not that much. Hi, uh, thank you uh, for your talk. Uh, you just show some amazing uh, numbers, but uh, how do you deal with the um, supervision of uh, like 400 kilo uh, new IOCs by, uh, by day? It's yep. just so <laughs> majority of our IOCs and numbers that we've got, uh, like 400,000 IOCs on a daily basis being ingested by ingested, I mean added, edited, or deleted is a lot. And the way we're handling it is through automation scripts as well as, as well as actual analysts looking at the data. Because automation can only go so far in terms of analyzing why it's there. Uh, but unless we've got human eyes on the IOCs and the events that are coming in and being checked and clarified, that IOCs 
those IOCs mean nothing because we need contextual data behind those IOCs. And for this, that contextual data to take place, we need human sources, unfortunately. So do you have a number of uh, actually running IOCs that you get from those uh, by days? Sorry, could you regard like a um, number of IOCs that you put on uh, supervision from those uh, four, uh, 400 kilos? Like, uh, do you have uh, some kind of percentage that goes to uh, supervision? Like your rough ID, just. So this slide. Uh, no, uh, slide with your, yeah, this one. Yeah. Like, do you have a, a percentage like which, how many IOCs do you get to supervise daily once they're uh, qualified uh, by uh, your, uh, your, your team? Yeah. So we try and, so the way we supervise the deletion and uh, editing of those IOCs is through pretty much users looking at it. We have uh, analysts taking two to three hours a day of their time going through those IOCs that need editing and uh, editing or deleted because we use specific tags. So we're not ingesting everything and with manual stuff. We have tags that are like teal uh, OSINT followed by what the OSINT data is. And if it needs humanize on it, the event won't be published. So of those 400,000 daily IOCs, I would say about 700 to uh, 900 IOCs are looked at on a daily basis through human eyes. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Nope. Again, thank you very much. Thank you.